And one of the things that I want to stress today is that crisis uh, and policy making, uh, they are very related. Uh, countries in development as usual, as I call it. Policy making in these countries is very different from countries coming out of crisis. It doesn't matter what type of crisis. Now, the other issue I want to emphasize is that uh, for the first time I, I heard Rachel some years ago, I, I don't like the term uh, fragile, in part because I was a risk analyst and uh, uh, I think the risks involved in countries coming out of a conflict are very different from those coming out of other fragility. And the main, the main objective in conflict countries is to make sure that you don't go back to conflict because the, 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 the propensity to do so is very, very high. In a recent study I did for the 30th, 30th anniversary of uh, WIDER, I look at uh, operations in which the UN has set up multidimensional operations, that is, not only peacekeeping, but also in the political, uh, economic, and social uh, aspects of the transition. And looking at those 21 uh, operations, looking at the first decade after the operations were set up, I found that 57% of them went back to conflict. So I mean, the, the, that is a very, very high risk over 50% risk of returning to, and for me, that should be the objective. So uh, let, me, let me just uh, mention, first of all, uh, I don't want to go through this very carefully, because I have written a, a new book that it's coming out soon, and if you are interested, I can send you chapter eight with all the premises for effective reconstruction of the economics of peace. So I, I don't want to go through this in great detail, but basically countries in this transition, they go through a multidisciplinary uh, transition that has political, security, social, and economic reconstruction aspects. But the issue is that we have, and I think one of the big failures is this silo appro approach that uh, somebody was talking about, I think Rachel and, and, uh, and Tony the first day, this silo approach, security people, especially in, in the US, the security people talk to the security people on the issues in Afghanistan and sometimes they have some contact with the political people, but they never meet with the people working on the economic reconstruction, the economics of peace, and on national reconciliation, which is the social transition. So the first problem for me is that this has been done in a silo, with a silo mentality and uh, not in an integrated way. And in fact, uh, uh, the um, uh, West Point tried to do this. In the case, since uh, David mentioned Afghanistan so much, in Afghanistan, what happened was uh, the same as in Iraq, that the military and the civilians actors were working together in these provincial reconstruction teams. They were working together, and then that led to something called expeditionary economics, which is basically economics done, economic reconstruction done by the military. And it was a big disaster because it was extremely expensive and very ineffective. And it was very difficult also to gain the hearts and minds when you were bombing at the same time. So it didn't work out. So the efforts of West Point to put these things uh, to ensure that we were looking at this double causality between these four sectors did not prosper very much, but I think it's something we should focus on. Uh, the first thing that when I, when I started working in the Secretary General's office in the early 90s, our first main challenge was the reconstruction of Afghanistan where the UN had been involved in the peacemaking, in the peacekeeping, and also in the, in the monitoring of the agreements. And there we thought, you know, country coming out of, uh, of, uh, uh, of war at very low, of civil war at very low levels of development, this is something we can leave to the World Bank and the UNDP. And it was a big disaster. First of all, 
because these development organizations have a mandate to collaborate with governments, so they are not uh, adaptable, or they cannot really, at least they are not perceived as impartial by their former insurgent group, in this case the FMLN. Uh, so after a few months, we realized that this was not development as usual, something that the World Bank and UNDP resisted very much. For instance, we tried to involve the World Bank in the land program. There was an exchange of arms for land. And we tried to involve the, the World Bank, and the World Bank said, well, we can't do that because there are 300,000 campesinos without land, and we can't, you know, we can't give credit to the few, a few who were related to the to the war uh, when there are so many others in the same need. So this, these things made us realize that this is not development as usual. First of all, the economic transition takes place amid, um, in the midst of the other transitions, the political, the national reconciliation, and uh, um, the security transition. Uh, national reconciliation in countries coming out of civil war is, is really a must because these former combatants usually come back to the same villages in Afghanistan and elsewhere, and they have to live with each other. So national reconciliation is it's uh, essential for this process to succeed, and it's a very expensive process. So basically, when I said it, that um, the economics of peace, of economic reconstruction, is not development as usual, means that the political in this, it, it's an intermediate phase between the economics of war, the economics of conflict resolution, and the economics of normal development. And in, during that transitional period, the political objective should prevail over the economic one, which means that optimal economic policies, financial policies, which are uh, some, sometimes even imposed by the IMF and the World Bank, cannot are not desirable or even attainable. So, so this, this has been a major factor when you look at these operations and why they failed. This has been a major factor. The other thing I want to, to mention is that policy making in crisis situation, and here I'm including a financial collapse and I'm including natural disasters, is completely different from normal development. You know, development economies usually have the luxury to think in terms of the medium and the long term and design their policies accordingly. This does not happen after a crisis. After a crisis, you have to take measures, and sometimes you know they are distortionary, and you know you are going to regret it later on, and you have to do it. And one of my worst experiences was in Kosovo when I was the economic uh, uh, policy advisor to Kushner. And in August, we knew that the, all the, the, the people living on the top of the mountains whose uh, roofs had been destroyed by the war, that they would have snow and we had to do something about that. And because of restrictions with the European Union that we couldn't buy local materials and things like that, we ended up buying something like was like a kit with a plastic to put all around a room so people could sleep there over the winter. And then in the spring, we had to start the reconstruction seriously. But we knew this cost a lot of money, and we knew it was going to be wasted after the summer had, they had to be destroyed. But this, these are the things you have to do and you have to do after a crisis. The other thing that it's very difficult in terms of policy making is that normal under normal development, you have stable and low flows of aid. And during this crisis, there is a spike in aid. And you have to be very careful how you use that aid uh, so you don't create the high degree of corruption and you use it as, as effectively as possible. Which doesn't mean that you have to delay it until the country has the capacity. This is something Collier says, and I'm totally against. He says, well, you should delay aid 
until the fifth or sixth years when the country has higher absorptive capacity. By then, most of these countries have gone back to war. So you have to be, you know, you have to balance these things. It's not as easy. In theory, yes, you should wait, but in practice, you shouldn't because the chances of going back are very high. The other thing is that and, and it's very difficult to, uh, for the World Bank to accept, but finally, o over a decade later, they accepted that you have to make a, ap apply the reconstruction principle rather than the development principle where you treat every group with the same needs equally. Here, you have to make Either after natural disaster, you have to help the people that are most in need, even if there are others uh, with the same uh, needs elsewhere. And especially after war, the people that have suffered the war uh, most seriously, you have to do something about them, particularly those that have the guns and that have gone to conflict to start with, because you know that if you don't give them a, a way of living, they are going to return to war. The other thing, well, there are other issues involving the international community. I mean, in the, in the crisis I work in Latin America, if you had that degree of interference from foreigners, countries would be very upset. But here, you know, countries like Afghanistan that got 50, 5% of GDP in aid every year for the first 10 years uh, after the military intervention, you know, you have to deal with the international community whether you want it or not. And then the issue is whether your policies, whether you're going to have any ownership at all of your policies. And, you know, you have to have ownership. Countries have to have ownership for policies to be sustainable. So uh, there are other premises, and I, go, I want to go very quickly over them because, uh, as I said, you can look at them in detail. But basically, uh, one of the big problems in Afghanistan was that uh, Ghani, and here it's not, you know, people like to blame the, the IMF and the World Bank, but here it was Ghani, now president, but finance minister at the time, who created this absurd perfect macroeconomic framework that countries like uh, Uruguay and Brazil don't have with total independence of the central bank and things totally absurd in a country that needs the flexibility and the simplicity of having a very um, a low skilled a civil service. So um, this has most of the aid in Afghanistan, something like 80% of the aid that has gone into the country has been to support foreign aid, uh, experts into the ministries. So this is something that a, a conflict countries cannot afford. They have to have a simple microeconomic framework that which they can uh, work with the people they have. And the other thing is that the more complex the, the, the framework, the easier it is for corruption to take place because you know people don't understand how it works. And then the other, the, the premise for is that the private sector has to be effectively engaged. And one of the problems is that at the UN, for instance, the UN gets into the mediators uh, team, they get experts on gender, on human rights, on this and that, but they don't get economies. So the issue is that whatever you put in, into these peace agreements, whatever, they have to be implementable. And in many cases, in the economic and social area, they set up arrangements and um, programs that are not economically feasible in this economy. So it's very important that peace negotiators have the economic capacity to work out with the private sector what the private sector can provide and uh, is feasible in the post-conflict period. The, the, the fifth pre premise has to do with the impact of aid, that it has to be a, not only maximized through effective and integrated and sequenced and non-corrupt 
practices. What we have at the present time is totally fragmented aid, which is mostly in the case of Afghanistan again, and it, but in the case of uh, Liberia and in the case of Haiti, for instance, it mostly channeled according to donors' preferences outside the national budget. And that has several problems. First of all, there is no ownership on the part of the government, but also, if it's channeled outside, you are not building the capacity in the public sector that you need to build in these situations. And besides, I mean, in addition, you have that channeling aid outside the national budget is much more expensive. I mean, there are all kinds of studies about that, how much more expensive it is. The other, the other issue is how you move from aid to foreign direct investment. The bank and the fund had made incredibly optimistic um, um, projections on how much aid was going to come. They talk about all the minerals in, uh, in Afghanistan and all that. The issue is that foreign direct investment peaked at 4.5% in 2005, and since then it had dropped to 0.3%, despite all the minerals and despite of the, and, and when it peaked to 4%, it was mostly in construction and services for the international community that was in Afghanistan, in Kabul at that time. So I mean, so they haven't benefited at all, despite their resources, they haven't benefited at all on FDI. And this is where I've been doing a lot of work because I've been doing on reconstruction zones where the foreign investors come and work in a win-win project with the communities. Up to now in Liberia, some work I've done for you and you on Liberia, foreign investment, particularly in plantations, and in mining, they displace the communities, they ruin their livelihoods, and then they are in confrontation with the, with the, with the communities. The issue is how the, the communities can provide security to the investors so that there is, they can be productive investment in, in all these resources that most of these countries have. Uh, the, 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 the use of resources has to be fair because otherwise uh, you are creating a new a new conflict. And also you have to compensate the spoilers because you know, like in Angola, if you, if you take the diamonds away from the insurgency, you have to give them something in exchange. Otherwise they are not going to be supporters of the peace process. Uh, premise seven is that growth is not enough. I mean, the IMF and the World Bank complement each other all the time about the 9% the growth in Afghanistan, the 9% growth for the first decade in Liberia and all that. The issue, the truth of the matter is that 80% of the population has not got any benefit from that growth. Most of the infrastructure is built for the main, uh, for the domestic elites and the foreign investors, and there is no level playing field for the 80% of the population that lives in the rural sector. And in fact, um, I wanted to, to mention to Rob Voss today, because he mentioned the need to increase the productivity in the rural area. And you know, one thing that it's very clear, and there are lots of studies, uh, is that, uh, of that 80% that lives in rural areas in these fragile states, f f over 40% are, are women. I mean, 40% are women, but women represent more than men in the rural labor. And the, the difference in productivity between men and women is tremendous. So if you want to increase productivity, uh, give inputs to the women, and that's the easiest way to increase the productivity. I mean, everybody talks about it, but they don't do it. At the UN, there is lip service about gender rights and, uh, and all that, but you know, you have to empower women if you want them to have any rights. Uh, finally, uh, because this is so different from development as usual because reconstruction in countries coming out of war or other a large crisis is so different. You have to use a different yardstick. For instance, if, if we judge the, the arms for land 
program on, on economic or financial criteria like we would do a normal uh, rural reform, I think it was very bad. But it was very good in the sense that it kept, you know, the, the ceasefire was a perfect ceasefire. N not even in Mozambique, there was a perfect ceasefire. So we have to use a more qualitative measure to, and the basic, during this period, of, during the reconstruction period, the, 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 frame, the, um, the measurement, the, um, the yardstick should be to ensure that the country does not reverse to war. Uh, just to end, I don't agree Mozambique was a big success. Uh, I was doing some work uh, on Mozambique and, you know, a country that, if you believe in the Human Development Report, which I do as a good measure of human development, you know, Mozambique, first, you, you don't compare a country from a period of war to reconstruction. You should start from a period where there was no war because, you know, otherwise you are really distorting the statistics. But most importantly, I think that uh, Mozambique, after two and a half decades in peace, the, the improvement in human development has been nil and even negative. In 92, the, in the Human Development Report, it was at the bottom 10%, and now it's worse. So we have to be very careful how we measure success in, in these uh, countries. Thank you.